effective politicians have not been those that have been determined by race, but uh, individuals who actually have a deeper commitment, have expressed a deeper commitment to the struggle for social equity, to the struggle to lift up the lives of people who feel that they are in fact not part of the political equation. And uh, that is what should matter. That is what should drive, you know, any kind of race. And so I am not opposed uh, to the, the idea that, in fact, you know, white politicians cannot, you know, uh, deliver and so forth. And so uh, the 13th Congressional District race is, is very unique. Uh, Congressman John Canis was the civil rights icon, uh, one who uh, contributed immensely uh, to the struggle, to, to some of the, what I call, the battles of the last 50 years, right? The battles around equity, the battles around, around you know, uh, making sure uh, that people, in fact, uh, the, 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 the battles around uh, realizing the opening words of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and women endowed, you know, with certain unalienable rights among these, the, life, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So all the paths, the preamble of the Constitution, we the people, and all of that. Congress and candidates always have been fighting to make sure that America realizes that goal, and of course, this idea of a more perfect union. So I get all of that. I get the legacy question. I guess I get the, the, the contribution, the monumental contribution towards the battle for equal rights or in the battle for equal rights. And I get, I get all of that. But to suggest that, in fact, that a black candidate would be the right one to actually fulfill or uphold that legacy, I think that's a, um, a uh, catch-22 question. I do not believe that a, just having a black candidate succeed Daniels would mean that individual would, in fact, be the one to uphold uh, the legacy of communists. And, you know, I have covered black politicians. You know, one, I've seen black politicians who are progressive. I've seen black politicians who are regressive. I've seen black politicians who are scared to death. Scared to death. Let me repeat. I've seen those who are scared to death, would not say one word when it was uncomfortable for people to stand. I've seen that. One of the reasons why, you know, a lot of people, I think, admire Congressman Kanye was his courage. It was not so much that he wanted to have his name on every equal rights battle or on every, uh, every um, you know, every release that goes out about, you know, fighting for justice. No, it was because he had the courage. And I've seen many black politicians who do not have the courage, will say one word, they'll duck. In moments of controversy, like Dr. King says, the measure of a man, it's not where he stands in, 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 in times of comfort, but where he stands in moments of controversy. I've seen black politicians who will duck. They will run away. They will say one word, and it becomes so obvious. You ask yourself, why isn't this person speaking up? You want me to do a roll call? We can do a roll call in Detroit. People that are scared to death to say anything. You know, so to suggest that, in fact, a black candidate would be the right person to succeed candidates and can hold of Paul Connie's legacy, I'm not sure about that. I honestly am not sure that that, in fact, can be a uh, real, you know. But look at the entire Congressional Black Caucus in Washington. Look at that group. Now it's the Black Caucus, it's the, it's the, it's the, 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 the public body, if you will, for all the member, black members of Congress. But not every, not every one of that group is courageous. I can mention when I look at the CBC in Washington, there are very few members of Congress that I can mention that are courageous. Maxine Waters, um, you know, Barbara Lee, I can mention they're very few. Some don't want to, talk, you know, so this idea that just because someone is black, that means that they can automatically express uh, black negritude, uh, the rights of blacks and so forth, what they do. I don't think so. In Detroit here, yeah, we can do a roll call on black politicians. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm getting ready to get into. You know? You know, we can talk about black politicians in this city who are speaking out, who are challenging themselves, or who are challenging downtown, city hall. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Why is all of a sudden there's a conspicuous sign? a deafening sign, an obvious sign on the number of issues in this town. Not one word. So you want to sell me this idea that 
the weight of Kanye's legacy and the weight of history that has informed him requires that a black candidate succeed who can continue the history of the I'm not sure a black candidate can continue that history. I'm not sure. But I can tell you what I'll do is, I think a qualified candidate who has the courage, who has uh, the commitment, can continue that legacy. And that can either be a white candidate or a black candidate. You know? I've seen many black politicians in this town. And I'm not, and then please understand, don't say, well, Bankel is all of a sudden now, wow, he's, no, I'm not switching. You know, my, my conviction is clear. I believe in everything that I write. From the first graph in my account to the last column, I believe, I live it. I, I believe in it. I don't write for optics. And I'm certainly not writing for, to impress anybody. I think anybody who follows my work knows that by now, Bankel doesn't write to impress anybody. Now, you may get mad to hell and, you know, after reading the paper or, you know, reading online and just, cuss me out and call me all kinds of names, that's fine. You know, that's fine. But I don't write for optics, I believe in what I write. But when we look at our black politicians, you know, we can go by what we have now, examine their record, right? Their body of war, right? Their public commitment, you know? We have many politicians in the stand that will choose to duck. They don't want to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the firing squad, in the political, let me qualify that, in the political firing squad, you know? And being a critique of somebody or an administration or somebody doesn't mean that you hate that individual. It just means that you want to have a rigorous debate because out of a rigorous debate, you can have healthy public policy. You challenge the man. You get a healthy public policy. He looks at himself and says, okay, here's the deal. Bankler, I hear what, I'm, I hear what you're saying. I can meet you in the middle of the road. Here's what we here's what we need to do. You know, you challenge the city council. You know, here's where we can meet. But to not say one word at all when it's very obvious. And you walk around here and beat your hand to your chest. Where's the public commitment? Where is it? So that's the reason that these are all the reasons that informed uh, me and why I wrote uh, that column yesterday. And I know it was a shocker to a lot of people. I got a lot of texts, lots of calls, and so forth. Because a lot of people didn't see it coming. But I just don't tore any line. I don't do that. You know, I don't tore any line. And I just think that it's important for us to put that in the conversation. You know, go for the qualified candidate. Go for someone with the courage of their conviction. Go for someone who can speak out. Someone who isn't afraid. If that's Brenda Jones, fine. If that's Bill Wild, fine. If that if that's the state senator Ian Kanyas, fine. If that is, you know, uh, John the Third, if that's Cole Senator Coleman Young, I mean I can go down the list. Kimberly Hill, you know, Chanel Jackson, I can go on and on and on. Michael Gilmore, I can go on and on. But to settle with this idea that we have to go with someone black. You have to look what is their public commitment. What's their resume? You know, I'm impressed by politicians who speak out, who are not afraid. You know, you know, who are ready to ask tough questions. Who understand what their job is. Not politicians who stand next to another politician and act like the politician is their boss, like they're working for that individual. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm getting at. Step up. Have the courage of your conviction. The reason why we think about Shirley Chisholm is because she wasn't afraid. I'm put on boss. She wasn't afraid. You sit here and admire Maxine Waters. But look how Congresswoman Maxine Waters isn't afraid to push the envelope. She has courage. You don't even have a quarter of her courage. But you sit here and admire her. But no, she's not. You're not her. You don't even have a quarter of the courage of Maxine Waters. And when you begin to have the courage, then we can have a real conversation. You talk about Barbara Lee. Do you have their courage? I can go on and on. Sheila Jackson Lee. Houston. You know, these are black members of Congress who have demonstrated that they're not afraid. 
they will speak up and speak up. And everybody else just walk around, bow their heads and not say anything. Yeah. So, as it relates to Detroit, we have a lot of politicians, you know, and, you know, look at their political biography. Look at their resume. See whether in their resume there have been that many public debates. You know, how have they been fighting for equity? You know the thing, the reason why, you know what I admire about Republicans in Washington? Let me give you a quick example. You don't see it in Detroit. Republicans, you know what I admire? They will take the fight to you. They may be wrong-headed in their fight. But they'll bring the fight. They'll bring it to you. They'll bring the fight. They're that courageous. 